If you think of religion as something to do with God, the story we're going to tell is not about religion. It's about the teaching of a man. It's about Buddhism. Here at Polynomua, one of the ancient capitals of Sri Lanka, the island we used to call Ceylon, I was given a lesson in how to look at a statue. My teacher, then and for most of this search, was the Venerable Ananda Maitreya, former Vice-Chancellor of a Buddhist University, described in an address from the Buddhists of Burma as greatest of pundits, picked to represent his country on a visit to Mao's China. I was a bit scared to meet him, till I met him. When you see a figure of the Buddha, from his uh, eyes of the statues, it teaches you the control of eyes. It Rest teaches you control. Uh, control of restraint of restraining eyes. Control of your eyes. From the mouth, control of mouth. Control of speech, restraining speech. And uh, from, his, uh, from the hands of the, the, the statue, the restraint in hand, in your, in your activities. Uh, from the feet also, the restraint in feet. The whole body explains or expresses the restraint of whole body. The so control of our body. So the stillness of the statue isn't just a matter of being stone. It is an invitation yes. to emulate, to yes. do the same thing. Yes. So there's religion. There is the real dharma. The doctrine is there. The doctrine um, symbolized. Ananda Maitreya lives in deliberate simplicity about 10 miles from Colombo. When I asked him what he thought his greatest weakness was, he said books. From his little house, he's planning a Buddhist study center for interested foreigners. In the meantime, he writes and teaches and receives visitors. If I say to you, can you put Buddhism in a nutshell? Yes. What would you do? The Lord Buddha said, Sabhapapas akaranam kusalasa upasampada sakitta pariyodapanam etam buddhana sakana which means Sabhapapas akaranam to shun all evils kusalasa upasampada to do good sakitta pariyodapanam Purification of your mind, etam buddhaan svasana. This is the teaching of all the buddhas. Yes. Not easy. Well, it's very easy if you understand it. <laughs> Back to school. A nearby Buddhist Sunday school. My companion was Dr. Ratnapala, professor of anthropology in Colombo and a Buddhist layman. studied in a Sunday school when I was young and I think elements of Buddhism I learned from this school. The primary aim is to mold character. Although you may learn things by heart, the first thing that they teach is love, respect all life, then equality, then the tolerance. You know, it's one of the things that I like in this country is tolerance. You are tolerated. So these three things were taught to me and they helped me a lot to mold my character. If the Buddhists have an equivalent of the Lord's Prayer, this seems to be it. I take the Buddha as my refuge. I take the Dharma as my refuge. I take the Sangha as my refuge. In other words, I take refuge in the Enlightened One, that's the Buddha. I take refuge in the truth he saw and preached. <laughs> 
that's the Dharma. I take refuge in the community of monks who live by the teaching and carry it out to the world. That's the Sangha. After school, some of the children told Dr. Ratnapala and me their favorite stories. They were all taken from the Buddhist scriptures and they were all about the former lives of the Buddha. Like this one, on respect for elders. An elephant, a monkey and a partridge tried to establish which was senior so as to bring some order to their community. When I was young, said the elephant, I could walk over that tree and it scarcely touched my belly. When I was young, said the monkey, I could sit on the ground and gather leaves from its topmost branches. When I was young, said the partridge, I ate a seed which passed through my body and dropped to the earth. And from the seed grew the tree. So the seniority of the partridge was established, and the other two paid their respects to him. And I, said the Buddha, was that partridge. But who is the Buddha? You get one possible answer by retracing his steps back to India. This is Bodhgaya in northern India, where a giant stone relic box dwarfs a tree. Here, says the tradition, two and a half thousand years ago, under a tree, a man sat. He'd been born into luxury, and that hadn't satisfied him. He'd tried self-denial, and that had nearly killed him. Now, at the age of 35, he sat here and after great inner journeyings, woke up to the truth. It's the literal meaning of the word Buddha. He is the one who has woken up. After his awakening, says the tradition, he walked to Benares, where in a nearby deer park, and the deer is still there, he preached his first sermon, and with that sermon won his first five disciples. But the question remains, who is the Buddha? Is he supernatural? Is he God? Is he immortal? He's a man, an extraordinary man. From the very beginning of his life, he's extraordinary. That's the case, not supernatural. Natural, but extraordinary. It wasn't that Ananda Maitreya back in Sri Lanka exactly disapproved of that trip to India, but I got a strong impression that given the choice, he preferred live teaching to a dead relic. Ananda Maitreya's hometown, as you can tell if you see his full name, is Barangoda, because it's the custom here to make the name of your birthplace part of your permanent label. Barangoda Ananda Maitreya. He took me to the local temple to see the monk in charge, a man in his 90s. He's a great friend of mine. Oh, is he? Yes, when I was about uh, 30 men in my school days, from my school days, yes. he was a great friend of mine. Oh, yes, he's much elderly. Yes. Is he very much your senior? Yes, about four years. The scenery is calculated from the day that you are ordained. So it's our custom that we have to pay respect to our senior. If he's senior to me, even in one minute, I have to respect him. In this society, it's no bad thing to be old. Who is this? What's this this is the son of Prince Dharta. So the Dharta. man who became the Buddha. Oh, yes. And here is the Buddha. Yes. And he's very tall. Yes. Why is he so big? Well, the Buddha had two bodies. A spiritual body and physical body. The figure shows the nature of physical body. In yes. appearance. Yes, in appearance. But the height shows the height of his virtues infinite virtues. One thing about the temples we visited, they don't lead you to an altar. 
There's no holy of holies kept separate from the people, with God one side and you the other. Tableau by tableau we are taken gently through a story, the life story of the Buddha. In the temple, do you think of it as a kindergarten? Oh, somewhat like kindergarten class. Uh, and the, the kindergarten is actually a spiritual life. They're forbidden. Do people get stuck there? Well, <laughs> if they will get stuck, then there's no progress. This is a fledgling relative of the Buddha with his parents. He's been a novice monk for one hour exactly. If, after five, ten or fifty years, he decides to disrobe, nobody's going to stop him. So the events of an hour ago weren't as final as they looked. He has his head shaved. Why is that? Uh, for the simplicity's sake. While the shaving happens, the candidate is made to hold and look at a clipping of his own departing hair. It's his first lesson in meditation, they told me. There was a nice informality about the style of the ceremony, but nothing haphazard about the timing. It happened at an hour and on a day that was astrologically exactly right. From Buddha's point of view, best astrological moment is when your mind is strong enough full of self-confidence and energy. <laughs> Nevertheless, the astrological calendar had been consulted. In his lifetime, the Buddha ordained nuns as well as monks. At the moment, there are 15,000 monks in Sri Lanka and no ordained nuns, though there are moves from time to time to re-establish them. <laughs> This is the last time he'll pay respect to his parents as a layman. The ordination proper begins with the three refuges. I take the Buddha as my refuge, I take his teaching as my refuge, I take the community of his disciples as my refuge. The language he's having difficulty with is Pali, 
that's the language of the earliest Buddhist scriptures. These are his new robes. <coughs> A layman observes five precepts, five undertakings. Not to destroy life, not to steal, not to misuse sex, not to lie, and not to take intoxicants. As a monk, he'll take five more. Not to eat after 12 noon, not to dance, sing, or attend shows, not to decorate himself, not to use soft beds, not to handle gold or silver. I asked Ananda Maitreya if ordination gave a man any special powers. That's the, something like a blessing from God or somewhat like that. There's no such thing in Buddhism. Because it is everything is you. You depend on what you do. You shouldn't expect any external help from a spirit or from anybody for, for your own development. <laughs> Now, and the boy himself could scarcely believe it, the parents and grandparents he'd bowed to ten minutes earlier queue up with presents and bow to him. With regard to the spiritual life, the boy is higher than the parents. Spiritually he is higher. Parents know this. The umbrella, by the way, is the thing he liked best. At the end of the day, as if he'd read my thoughts, Ananda Maitreya said, don't worry, for some time at least he'll be junior to every other monk he meets, and if he gets above himself, we shall help him down. The word you hear a great deal in talk with Buddhists is the word suffering. Being alive is suffering, dying is suffering, even being happy is suffering. If they're saying what they seem to be saying, Buddhists should have the world's longest and sourest faces. It was a relief to find out that the word you cling on to as you take your first steps in Buddhism isn't simple suffering. It's better translated as unsatisfactoriness, instability, uncertainty. Nothing ever stays the same. I'll try and put it to you as it was put to me. Here am I sitting comfortably in this chair. In an hour's time, I might still be quite comfortable. In 24 hours, I'd be in fair agony. In 24 years, I'd be a cripple. And in 240 years, I'd be bones. And the chair would be looking pretty seedy too. Even if you try to keep quite still and not change, change will still happen and there's nothing anybody can do to stop it. So if, like most people, you're a clinging man in a world which never stops changing, what do you cling to? Some would say God. 
Even the crowd at an English football match sings, O thou that changest not, abide with me. But Buddhists don't accept the idea of one unchanging, almighty God. The problem, they say, is man's problem. And the Buddhist solution, as far as I can understand it, is you must cling to nothing because there's nothing anywhere solid enough to cling to. And if you can't cling, however much you want to, you're faced with one unthinkable, terrifying alternative. You've got to let go. When a novice is at least 20, he can be ordained a fully-fledged monk, a bhikkhu. In this tradition, a bhikkhu doesn't eat after 12 noon, and what he eats, he begs for. Simply whatever house we see first, then we go there. If they offer us, then we accept. If they don't offer, then we pass over to other house. Do you collect food for other monks or in your begging bowl? Yes, just sometimes your if there are a number of monks in the temple, so uh, we uh, collect uh, some food, even sufficient for others. I asked the layman, the food givers, why they did it. Giving is the way to get inner wisdom, said one of them. But the rest talked about meritorious actions, gaining merit, like accumulating a store of spiritual riches that will help them to a better rebirth. I found myself wondering if it was difficult to beg. No, because when we joined the order, naturally, we have to give up our pride because we know we live on others. Even with an alien tagging on behind, the pace of the walk was deliberate and the concentration unbroken. Take two monks. One sits and meditates, one goes out and serves society. Which is more praiseworthy? Well, that depends on motive. The motive? Yes. According to his motive, either this or that person is preferred. I suppose I wanted him to approve of the bhikkhu who bustled about doing good. When we go arms begging, if we do it properly, properly, well, I mean correctly, you have to meditate, you have to extend your love and kindness with the people who offer you arms. So you have to spread that loving feeling, that loving kindness, feeling of love and kindness towards them. It purifies even in that moment your mind. It's a kind of blessing, mental blessing. About the meditation on loving kindness, I believe that you begin it by concentrating on yourself and loving yes, yourself. Yes, yes. Self-love, I was brought up to believe, is an evil thing. Well, if it stops there itself, then it's, it may be an evil thing, but you don't stop there itself. First you love. It is natural that everybody loves himself uh, better of all other persons. So you have to extend your love. First you, you have to experience your love on yourself, love for yourself. So you experience your love. Then you have to extend the very same experience towards all other living beings. Can a man who doesn't love himself then not love other people? Well, a man who doesn't love himself never loves others. It is impossible. <laughs>
<laughs> Come to think of it, the Christian gospel says, love thy neighbor as thyself, not more than thyself, and certainly not less. But am I right? The Buddha did require his bhikkhus to serve. Uh, well, yes. For the benefit of the people, for the good of the people, for the welfare of the people. To teach and preach and help the people. So he sent out the first historical world mission. Before that, there was no world mission like that. It was the start of a world mission. And the mission, what is more, without bloodshed. the day before a full moon, and these are pilgrims. For the last three months, traditionally the monsoon months, monks have been keeping what's called the rain retreat. Now it's nearly over, and up there in the forest hermitage of Wataruila, preparations are being made to welcome the laity once again. I first knew the procession had started when I heard this extraordinary surging whisper. It must have been about two in the morning. Under the canopy there, you can just see a bale of cloth. At the end of the rain retreat, the monks get new robes. That cry of sadhu, sadhu, sa, it seems impossible to translate. Something between may you be happy, well done, and amen. In an assembly hall under a jutting rock sit the monks of Watruwila, some from the main house and some from small hermitages. These are forest-dwelling monks, and the paradox is that, having forsaken society, they seem, in some extraordinary way, to draw society after them. If you look at those sacrifices that are brought by the people, you find that each one brought according to his own means. The poorest brought a cake of soap, or maybe even a broom. And I saw a piece of neatly folded brown paper, a ball of string, an exercise book, and a bottle of cough mixture. People who have given their gifts and people who have no gifts to give line the route and touch the presents as they go by. So everybody shares in the merit. The main ceremony was over by daybreak, but the pilgrims lingered on for the sideshows and to talk to the monks and take guided tours around the buildings and make a day of it. Some of these ladies had booked a year in advance for the privilege of bringing and cooking the monks' food for the day. Dr. Ratnapala translated. Well, could you tell me, first of all, about the five precepts? Not to kill any animals yes. at all. Mm. Is, she, is she a vegetarian? Mm. 
But the merit of the day's cooking would presumably help her do better in her next birth, and she prayed I'd do better in mine. So, as, uh, does she think that because I've been born in England as a Christian, that I've done something wrong in my former life? <laughs> She says, yes, that you have done something bad in the other life and you have been born in a country like that. Is there hope for me? Is there hope for me? Is there hope for me? Is if you, if you uh, exercise a lot of effort now and get into the right path, you will never be born in a country like that. <laughs> yeah. Here are two boys with a remarkable aptitude for ancient languages. They chant and translate from Pali and Sanskrit. Some say you can't account for such accomplishments in the space of one short life. At an early age, these boys talked of being in a bus crash. Bit by bit, a story was pieced together about the death of two Tibetan monks in India and their rebirth here as twins. In the middle of these celebrations, I found myself comparing the relationship of these monks and these laymen with the relationship of a town and its football team. The spectators aren't players and probably could never be. The players are in some ways idolized, in some ways trapped. What they do out there on the pitch is something very special to them and they can't be either interrupted or helped while the game is at its height. Now and again, the spectators are let onto the field and there's a great jostling celebration. <laughs> then, for the monks, back to simplicity. I'd met a newly ordained American monk who talked about simplicity. The reason that you give up things, or in classic terms you renounce, is so that you don't have too many things around you to distract you from what you should be doing, which is investigating yourself. First you have to find out who you are as yourself, and then you can get about the business of eliminating yourself. But uh, at the state of the world now, the main thing is to find out who we are and what we are. And what we do need is uh, lives that are much too complicated, much too complex, much too cluttered. So that if one is going to start to take up a spiritual practice, or one is going to start to uh, meditate, one has to uh, literally sit down in, uh, in, in, in empty mental rooms. And to start to create an empty mental room, you have to start to create an empty physical room. So you have to start to clear out the unessentials. Getting the impression that a Buddhist is always looking through a spyglass, which is his mind, is always seeing the whole world and everything through this lens of your mind. So when you say purify the mind, is it the same as saying clean your lens? Um, clean your glasses? Well, it is somewhat like that then you can see clearly if you purify your mind then you can see the nature as it is as real it is the world as it is there's the realization so you would call buddhism a severely practical thing of seeing the world as it is mm -hmm. not seeing it painted gold no, or pink. no 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 you have to penetrate all the appearances you have to penetrate it and the Buddhist device for penetration, said Ananda Maitre, is the Noble Eightfold Path, the eight spokes of a wheel. Right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, right thought, 
right understanding. So, and he used the eight spokes of his parasol to make the point, while we're tied to the cycle of birth and rebirth, we're on the perimeter. As we take the noble eightfold path, we move bit by bit down the spokes to the still point at the center. No more birth, no more rebirth, nirvana. When I asked a well-respected Buddhist monk about nirvana, he said, you can no more describe nirvana than a frog can describe dry land to a shoal of tadpoles. And he went on to elaborate. Even the cleverest tadpole, he said, can only ask questions about the element he lives in. And all the frog's answers are going to seem negative. No, uh, dry land doesn't have fish. No, you can't float over it. No, fresh air is not like water until the tadpoles get the idea that he is describing some impossible, negative, nowhere. With earthly thought, said the monk, you cannot think nirvana. From nirvana, you cannot think an earthly thought. In other words, don't look to the Buddha for help with the harvest, help with money, help with a job. Look to the Buddha for help with the truth. 